Thank you very much, Chris, for this nice introduction. So I will tell you today some work I'm doing. I'm involved uh, about the formation of our galaxy, about my, the Milky Way. So I hope uh, that you like astronomy, or at least you are engaged uh, in uh, listening to what's going on in this field. So what I want to um, start with is that this is how our Milky Way looks like for our planet, from, from, from the Earth. So when we look at the sky from the northern hemisphere, we can't see much about the Milky Way. But if you go on the southern hemisphere, and here there are other astronomers that are observers, I'm mostly a theoretician, <laughs> they really go to observe. <laughs> and so when you go on the southern hemisphere, this is uh, our Milky Way. This is the disk in which our planet is embedded, uh, you know, um, orbiting around uh, the sun which is embedded in the Milky Way, which has another 200 billion of stars like our sun. So we are just orbiting around one star, which is one out of 200 billion other stars in our Milky Way. So this is how it looks like uh, if you go to the southern hemisphere. Now this is uh, how we sketch the Milky Way, how we believe uh, you know, these are the constituents of uh, our galaxy. So there's a disk. This is a view, we call it edge on, where you see the disk. You are, you know, your your, your uh, uh, point of view, so your light of view is, uh, you know, is perpendicular to the plane. And so, and here there's a bulge of stars in the central part. The disk is done by stars and gas. And then there are um, concentrations of star clusters, of globular clusters, we call them. These are globular clusters of stars, which are also orbiting around our galaxy. And more farther, outside the, the galaxy, there's a, like a huge halo of dark matter, which is matter that we don't see. We just feel it gravitationally. We, we know that it must exist in order to explain some indirect evidence that we have about it. So we feel the gravity of this matter, but we cannot see it. So the only part that we see of our galaxy are the, are the stars and the gas but not a dark matter, which is like a halo around it. So if we could go you know, above our um, planet, if we could fly above the disk, our galaxy, the Milky Way, will look like this. So it looks like this galaxy with a lot of arms, some arms. These arms, these spiral arms, uh, are typical of galaxies like ours. So it's typical of spiral disk galaxies. They are typical in disks of stars. These are arms of stars and arms of gas. And uh, um, they are features uh, that we uh, are very recurrent, that we observe very uh, recurrently in, uh, in um, uh, many galaxies, like our own. Now, our galaxy is not so special. 70% of the galaxies in the universe are disk galaxies. They have a disk, like a Milky Way. So it's quite common. OK. So what I'm going to tell you today, well, now let's go a little bit more in detail on uh, our own galaxy. Where is placed our galaxy in the universe? So our galaxy is quite in an isolated region of the universe. We are not very close to many other galaxies. We are in what we call a local group of galaxies, which are only two big galaxies, our Milky Way and Andromeda, which is the nearest uh, companion. So this is Andromeda. This is a sketch of our Milky Way disk. That's the disk. The bulge will be at the center. And that's the halo of stars. And then you know, around there will be all the dark matter. So this is how the next, the, the companion of the Milky Way is, Andromeda. But then there's not only Andromeda and the Milky Way. There's a bunch of other little dwarf galaxies. So these dwarf galaxies are satellites, are dwarf satellite galaxies which are orbiting around either the Milky Way or either Andromeda. And here, you know, I sketched some of them. 
how they are uh, located with respect to the Milky Way. So among the most famous are a pair of dwarf galaxies, which are called the Magellanic Clouds. So they are very known as, mm, since to the ancient people. When they look in the sky, you can see from the southern hemisphere the Magellanic Clouds. So they are called the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud. So this, this pair of dwarfs are very interesting. Well, first of all, because they are the largest dwarf that we have around the Milky Way. Also because they probably, we believe uh, these days, that they are coming uh, as a pair, which just uh, came into, um, just came you know, in orbiting around the Milky Way very recently. And that's quite a new result. Uh, and until a few years ago, it was believed that the Magellanic clouds were orbiting around the Milky Way since a long time. Then there are other dwarfs, many others, as you can see. These are even smaller than, these, than the Magellanic clouds. Um, for example, Draco looks like on the sky, on the images, looks like this, looks like a little cloud, very, very faint. As you can see, as you compare to, the Milky, uh, to Andromeda, which is a huge uh, galaxy, like a spiral, this is very huge in luminosity. You know, it's, it's very easy to, to see on the, on the sky and even when the observers uh, go to take images, you know, it's, it's easy to see these big galaxies. But this one looks like, uh, you know, like a faint cloud. So many of these dwarf galaxies have been discovered only in the last uh, 20, 30 years. They were not known before. And even the closest dwarf has been discovered only in 1994, which is called Sagittarius. And it's very interesting, this very little dwarf, because um, I don't know if here, maybe it's not, uh, it's not listed, but Sagittarius is uh, the closest uh, uh, dwarf uh, uh, to the Milky Way. It's only right you know, uh, after the disk. And eventually, it, you know, it perturbed the disk, disturbed a lot our galaxy. So we believe that the disk has uh, some features that are due to the fact that this dwarf is just passing, uh, just passed close uh, very recently. But then what's very interesting is that these dwarfs, so these days, the observers like Ines, he, she's here on the first line, they are going and observing and finding new dwarfs around the Milky Way and then around the, um, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So they are finding what we call a new uh, species, new category of dwarfs, which are called ultra-faint dwarf galaxy. They are even fainter than this. So they were not discovered before. They just, they just have been discovered in the last 10 years because before they were, it was not possible with telescopes to detect them. They, they didn't, you could not see the difference with the background stars in the sky, in the images from the observers. So these are a new uh, category of dwarfs which have been discovered only in the last few, in the last few years. And with the new telescopes and new facilities, we are finding more and more and more. Now let me tell you why um, all these things are so interesting. Because I'm interested in understanding how the Milky Way is formed. And so um, when I approached, when I started to learn about astronomy, I wanted to study about the Milky Way, I thought, OK, Milky Way is probably a huge galaxy, how it came together. And I realized you know, by time and, and learning and going ahead um, uh, with the graduate school that actually the dwarf have a very important role in, the, in assembling the Milky Way. So these days, we believe that first formed the dwarfs, and the Milky Way only formed later. So it's true that the dwarfs are orbiting today around the Milky Way, but eventually they form much long time before the Milky Way. So what we believe in, um, in cosmology is that you know, the dwarf, the little systems in the universe form first. And then because they are uh, dominated by gravity, they attract one each other. So they tend to merge and forming larger and larger structures. So our Milky Way is much larger than the dwarfs, but eventually it contains many other dwarfs that have been destroyed uh, by tidal interactions and by gravitational interactions. So that's why, why are so interesting the dwarf galaxies for cosmologists and for dynamicists uh, as what I would like to be, because they they contain, they arrived up, up to us, so we know, we see them orbiting around the Milky Way, so we observe them, but they probably formed the, uh, much earlier. So they contain the information of the universe much before the Milky Way was assembled. 
So they and they sur and they manage to survive up to date. So they are very old system, like the health of our universe. They contain all the information of the first uh, the first uh, billion years uh, um, when the universe was formed. So we'll talk you about uh, some features of the satellite of these dwarf galaxies. Then I will tell you some features in the Milky Way I'm interested into which are also connected eventually to the presence of these dwarfs uh, and even to the presence of the dark matter. And then I will show you at the end uh, some, uh, some movies that can, can give us an idea in what we believe uh, and how beli we believe uh, uh, galaxies like our Milky Way have been formed in a cosmological context. So that's the last frontier, you know, to put all the pieces together and see if we can form self-consistently galaxies like our Milky Way. So what is a dwarf galaxy? So a dwarf galaxy is a, a, is a galaxy that is, has many less stars, much less stars than our Milky Way. So it doesn't have 200 billion stars as our Milky Way. Usually they don't have many stars, so they are very faint. They are also small, smaller in, in size. And again, just to give you an idea, so these are, you know, um, so the dwarfs uh, are Usually they come in different flavors. Some dwarfs uh, are more roundy, so they're like spheroidals, and they have a very old stars. Some are like, uh, you know, they have a little disk, and the disk is very regular. It's not, it's not well defined usually as uh, in a big galaxy like the Milky Way. And, and they, might, they might have, you know, some, some gas and even some younger stars. So the most interesting dwarf are the ones that don't have a disk, but they have only these old stars. These dwarf spheroidal galaxies are interesting because they have such old stars that you know, they contain the information of the universe in the early phases. That's why we are so interested in these dwarf spheroidal galaxies. And they actually, they are the ones who are closer usually to the Milky Way. So, this is, again, this is a, a, an example of one of these ultra-faint dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So you see, it's like, it's almost, you know, you see like a little cloud of stars. And some of these, the ones that have been recently discovered, are so faint, <laughs> like this one, that, you know, it's almost impossible to distinguish. It's just, you know, the good eyes of the observers can, can find them. And you see, um, so some of these galaxies, the ultra-faint dwarf, have something like 1,000 stars, you know, compares to 200 billion, so the Milky Way, it's a huge difference. So why they are so interesting? As I said, because they contain very old stars. Very old stars means, uh, you know, information of the early universe. They're very interesting also for another reason. For the reason that they, we believe that they contain much more dark matter than our Milky Way. So our Milky Way has, uh, 10% in baryonic matter, so in what we can observe. So when we look at the disk, the bulge of the, of the Milky Way, we only see 10% of the budget of the entire mass of the Milky Way. The 90% is essentially dark matter, invisible. When we go to the dwarf, it's even more dramatic. So essentially, the, these dwarf spheroidal seem to have very tiny, tiny percentage in visible matter. We just see these few, these a few thousand of stars, but the rest uh, we believe that should be completely dark, completely dark matter. So they are interesting for another reason because why they manage to be, you know, more dark, why they are more dark matter dominated than our galaxy? What's the difference? Why they are so small? What happened? Why they they could manage, you know, to um, to be so dark matter dominated compared to the, gal to the galaxy our, like our Milky Way? So there must be a process much more efficient happening there than in our Milky Way. So this is a, um, a movie that will show you what was the state of the art and few until a few years ago. So as cosmologists, we were not able to we are not able to uh, approach complicated systems, uh, you know, all the time in, the, in, in in one time. So what we usually uh, did up to now was to to try to simulate how the dark matter, um, you know, behave due to the gravity. So there's you know a, a theory that have been developed in the last 30 years, where you know people believe that um, some kind of particle, which we call cold dark matter, which we have never been observed, but you know, we believe that uh, should be the, c the candidate for the dark matter. 
So the idea is to uh, simulate, to start with uh, an initial simulation where um, there's an initial field of matter, and then this field was initially quite homogeneous, except that, that there were little fluctuations of their matter in you know, some places. These little fluctuations are showing a, a little bit more overdense matter than in the other parts of the universe. Because of the gravity, they tend to collapse quickly. So these are the first, uh, you know, progenitors of the structures that we will see today. So people made the simulation, um, simulations where we call cosmological simulations, in which uh, we, um, you know, they try to simulate portion of the universe, including this dark matter according to the theory, and see by gravity how the dark matter evolves by time. If we can, you know, form uh, um, this halo of dark matter that eventually will contain the baryonic matter, the visible matter that we observe in galaxies. And this is an example. So this is a simulation performed uh, um, in Santa Cruz. Um, so you see, these are, um, so all these particles are particles of dark matter. And uh, um, they tend to, so this is a formation of a halo of dark matter like our Milky Way, like the halo that should contain our Milky Way. And these are all clumps of dark matter, which are expected because, you know, um, for according to the theory that we have for the, for the structure formation, we believe that um, there's a lot of power that should come from, from the small scales of the dark matter. So we should have a lot of little structures that come together by gravity, and they are essentially forming uh, the halo of our Milky Way. So if we, you know, um, do not include the disk, the baryons, so the disk or the gas or the stars, that should be, this is like an image, if we could visualize the dark matter, that of course, you know, it doesn't emit uh, in the light, so we cannot really visualize it, but just to, to have an idea, this would be like a structure of our Milky Way, you know, that should contain a disk of stars, a bulge of stars and gas. So plenty, you know, of, of clumps, plenty of clumps of dark matter. Now, why they are so interesting? Oh, sure. Uh, you said little, how big? Uh, there's a distribution. So some, some will be very, very small. Some will be larger. So the maximum size of a clump should be something like uh, one of these dwarfs, so a few kiloparsec um, in, uh, in, in radius. So we can predict with the theory how many clumps are expected in the Milky Way and how massive they should be. So distribution for the mass, distribution for the size. Why it's so interesting? Because these clumps, the largest one, should contain the dwarf galaxies that we observe. So some of these should contain you know, the Magellanic Clouds or Draco or all these dwarfs that we see around the Milky Way. Now, as you can see here, there's a lot of clumps, so many clumps, more than what we um, know that we can really observe uh, as visible dwarf. So this has been a problem in the last 20 years in cosmology. So this has been called the missing satellite problem. So the missing satellite problem is essentially, uh, let me show you it's this. So this is a simulation that comes uh, from cosmology of our, Milky, of our local group, actually. So these two big, uh, are, uh, two big clumps uh, here are the halo of the Milky Way and Andromeda, M31. And here, you can see all these bigger clumps. They should contain dwarf galaxies, visible dwarf galaxies. But we only observe, we have observed until 15 years ago, they have observed only 11 dwarf galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way, and another 11, almost uh, roughly, around Andromeda. So for a total of 22, 23. Uh, but but now, uh, you know, but we, here we are predicting something like 500 uh, clumps that should contain visible galaxies within, you know, within this size. You have a question? Yes, so what is exactly the definition of dwarf galaxy? And how do I tell the dwarf galaxy from just a group of stars? Is it like density, luminosity, number of stars, mass? Yes, luminosity is important. So be below a certain magnitude, uh, we define a dwarf, uh, a galaxy to be a dwarf. But the difference between, for example, groups of stars like a cluster, globular cluster, and a dwarf uh, is that usually it's that the dwarf um, 
you know, they should contain dark matter, whereas the globular class uh, don't, don't seem to have any evidence uh, of, uh, of dark matter. But it's, uh, it's uh, such an interesting question because it's very debated, because there are, there are objects that have been discovered recently that they don't, they don't look like, well, they have some properties similar to globular clusters, then you would try to, you know, to classify them as globular clusters, but they have also other properties that are more similar to the, to the dwarf galaxies. So, um, and people, you know, they don't know, there, there's, there's a bunch of systems that they don't know how to identify. And now the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, which are so faint, just a bunch of stars, are so, uh, you know, so interesting and so different um, from what has been observed. They don't have all the properties of the previous galaxies that they, people are debating if they are a new class of galaxies or they are just, you know, um, a sim simply, you know, uh, we are just simply finding the faintest and faintest the dwarf uh, um, up to a certain point. So it's a, a completely open, um, open field now. And people are still discovering more and more and more dwarf uh, with new techniques. So the new facilities and the new abilities of, of observers, you know, to, to identify uh, new systems are, fine, and are bringing this problem probably uh, to, um, to, um, to a way where we can finally reconcile the theory with the observations because with the new discovery now, I think there are almost 50 dwarf galaxies that have been discovered now around the Milky Way and Andromeda, so we doubled the number in the last few years thanks to the discovery of the ultra-faint dwarf. And people are finding more and more, even around Andromeda. So we, it's not clear if um, you know if we can, if there's a, um, you know, if we can really reconcile completely the theory uh, with the observations. But it, but it's true that this new class of dwarfs, uh, you know, it's uh, it's you know it's matching, it's it's helping in matching the numbers. And so, of course, you know, this is a theory. So the colder matter is just a theory, but um, we know that it can explain. Uh, Thanks also to simulations and to the analysis and comparison between uh, uh, data um, about galaxies on larger scales in the universe, we know that this theory can, can explain many of the features, uh, except that when you go to uh, the size of galaxies like our Milky Way, there are still little problems with the, we know, with the, the most uh, uh, um, popular scenario for the structure formation with the colder matter theory, and this was one of the problems, which is getting better. But, but, but you know, we don't know if it's com will completely solved. You have a question? Well, the, yes, um, you know, these clumps uh, come from the fact that this fluctuation, these initial fluctuations, some which are more dense, they will collapse uh, earlier. So they will start forming earlier objects very dense. They are as... No, no, this is just dark matter. Then stars come later. So initially they form like... Uh, Structures which are quite resilient, the ones that form earlier, because they have, uh, you know, they have the memory of the density of the universe at the time when they are so over dense, and so they started collapsing, and then they they start they start merging. Now, when the, these clumps come together in larger systems, they don't merge anymore because they they have such such a high velocity that they will not uh, so they don't merge anymore, but they just continue orbiting around. Uh, around the larger system. So the dynamical friction that will bring them you know, to, the, to the central part of the system will take too long. So at the end, they, you start forming a lot of these clumps due to the, you know, the kind of dark matter that you are assuming, the model that you are assuming, and then you never get rid of them because they are so resilient, because they form so earlier. So they are so highly concentrated, so highly dense, so that you know, they don't get destroyed so easily. And that's why we end up at the end with having them you know, uh, as uh, candidates for dwarfs that we don't observe in total. So let me go, so that's another example of, um, so this is another example, another, uh, are two images of other two dwarfs. This is an ultra faint dwarf, Leo 1. This is Draco, just to show you again how faint they are, so. And, ah, okay, now first I wanted to tell you something else. So why they are also so interesting? Because, you know, the thing that really 
puzzled me most in the last few years was the fact that they are completely, no, they are very dark matter dominated more than the Milky Way. That means that they, some process needs to be very efficient in dwarfs to remove, you know, to, um, to get rid of the baryons of the gas and the stars more than what the Milky Way can do. Now, the Milky Way is larger, so it has a larger gravitational potential, so maybe it's not so easy to, to remove all the baryons, but it ends up in a way that the Milky Way, you know, has, a, has more stars and gas for that size than a dwarf, which is smaller, um, you know, it seems that had got rid of it uh, in a much easier way. So why, why this is, is going to happen? So people have postulated, they have assumed a long time ago, that in the dwarf galaxies, uh, there's a process that we call stellar feedback, which means uh, that the stars, when they are formed by the gas, so the gas uh, you know, enters into the dwarf, and uh, when it becomes very dense, it starts forming stars. The stars, after a few million years, uh, they explode by supernovae, and so they re-give back some, they, you can recycle some way, some materials, some baryons. Now, if you have a very little dwarf, the potential, well, it's not so deep. So what happens is that a few, even a few supernovae exploding after a few million years, you know, can be powerful enough to eject, you know, a lot of material out of the dwarf. And so you can, you can get rid you can get rid of the baryons quite quickly in a dwarf compared to the Milky Way. That's one explanation. There's also another explanation, which is uh, no alternative but complementary, is that the dwarfs also, you know, they can, since they are um, around, uh, they came, you know, up to, up to us, we can see them still today, after 13 billion years. So that means that they also had a long history in their life. So they can interact by gravity with other dwarf or with other larger with larger systems at a certain point and so what's what has been already studied very well in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is how the tidal interaction works so in, by tidal interactions uh, we can essentially explain how the galaxies lose some material forming tails and streams and we see also streams of stars uh, streams of gas around our milky way which we believe you know they belong to the dwarf which are orbiting around so all this process is concerned about, you know, um, tidal interactions can be well, very well understood. It can be also very well simulated using uh, these days uh, computational, the computational abilities that we have. So one example, so one idea is that the dwarf, when they orbit around the Milky Way or when they orbit around another dwarf before being assembled into the Milky Way, so they can, they can lose material, they can lose stars or gas if they contain it, not only by feedback, but also by gravitational, by tidal interaction. So the tidal interactions that will make you know, the stars forming long tails or streams of gas is resonance. So let me show you an example of a resonance. I think this is the Tacoma Bridge, probably you know it. So the bridge vibrates due to the resonance with the wind very scary but that's an example of a resonance kind of resonance happens also in dwarf galaxies. For example, you know, we studied this process uh, more in detail. So if you have a dwarf uh, which has a, a disk which is spinning, uh, there's a, you know, um, there's a sort of, um, of spin, of, of spinning frequency. And when it resonates with the orbital frequency around the larger system, like our Milky Way, you enter in a sort of resonance that can be very effective in removing baryons, so in removing stars or, or even gas. 
So, sorry, so sorry. That's what, that was the idea. And indeed, uh, you know, it's possible to people, including myself, we performed simulations where we used, you know, as our lab to understand these processes, we use embody simulations. So we, uh, we simulated the stars and the dark matter using particles. And then this is a case where a dwarf that initially had the disk of stars is interacting with another larger system. And you see star forming a tails of stars due to the tidal interaction, due, due to this kind of um, resonance. And in the other case, uh, since it's a resonance, it will be different depending if it's on a prograde um, encounter or on a retrograde encounter. A prograde encounter means when they are you know, oriented in the same way. The spin is, uh, is aligned you know, with the orbital frequency. They are aligned, basically. And the other case, uh, for example, like in this case, it's a retrograde, so the resonance is not very efficient. And in indeed, you can see that we don't form the same kind of tails of stars that we form in the in the previous in the previous case. So in the progress encounter, indeed, we had a much more efficiency in removing. So it's possible to explain uh, how you can predict, and then I will show you that you can even observe these long tails of stars, because if you have uh, your little dwarf, for example, it's like a victim. I called it victim. <coughs> so it has a disk of stars rotating. Let's say in this in this, um, in this uh, um, uh, direction. And then, uh, you know, uh, it's encountering, uh, it's interacting with the perturber, and the orbital frequency, you know, it's oriented on this way. Now you have to look at, you know, this counterclockwise, all the sequence. So the stars rotating in the disk will feel the perturbation of the big perturber, but now they are, you know, they are rotating on the same direction. So all the time, the stars, feel the same gravity from the perturber. And so they are all pulled in the same direction all the time. This is why you start forming long tails. The stars you know, start leaving your galaxy and forming long tails of stars. When it's a retrograde, it's also easy to understand. Now you know the victim, so the little dwarf, is rotating on this direction, but the perturber is going on the other direction. So if you, see, you, know, if you follow the sequence now clockwise, A, B, C, D, like this, now you, the star is feeling the perturber, but then, you know, after a little time, the star is going on the opposite direction uh, than the perturber. So the, all the stars will be, you know, pulled back and forth all the time, and so they will not form the long tails anymore. So that's, you know, the process which is behind the formation of the tails. Now let me show you that these are real observations. Some, some are observations, some are simulations. Okay, this is uh, the antenna galaxy. So these are two galaxies interacting. We have an image in the sky. They're called the antennae. And you can see this is a very long, uh, long tails of stars. So these are the two galaxies in the process of merging. Galaxies, they like to merge when they, because they attract one each other. When they can, they merge. So, and this is exactly you know, the same process that we believe is this kind of resonance that, that, that's going to happen. Uh, so this is another image in the sky of interacting galaxies. It's plenty of images like this in the sky. This is a simulation, and this is uh, um, another. This is the tadpole galaxy. Is, a, is an image. This is a simulation that try to reproduce that. And these are also after galaxies do merge. Usually, they form also shells of stars. And this is a simulation that shows that we can match with this, this process of similar features. Oh, sorry, I wanted to show you now a movie. Now, this movie has been done by a company, I believe, that works for NASA a few years ago using s some simulations uh, of my group at Harvard a few years ago, actually from my ex-supervisor. So this is the simulations, is two galaxies, two these galaxies which are merging, and now this is the observation. So they match time to time the observations with the simulations. Now, these two disks are in the process of interacting. They rotate them, and this is a real observation. OK, now this is also similar to another observation that you can see on the sky. This is, again, the simulation. It's the final process of the coalescence of the merger. And this is quite similar you know, qualitatively with the, with the antennae, for example. Okay. 
And this is another observation. Uh, the time scale is a few giga years, a few billion years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not so quick. But for us, that's why we use simulations. It's easier and it takes less time. Now, let me show you um, again, um, uh, in the last 10 minutes, I show you another example of this kind of tidal interaction. So this is what's called the Magellanic Stream of gas, which is a stream of gas around very close to our galaxy. So that's the observations. This is a stream of gas. And this is called the Magellanic Stream because these two galaxies are the Magellanic Clouds, the two dwarfs. Now, these are the observations that people knew about. And now, let me show you that we can reproduce, we can understand this uh, observation using simulations and using this kind of resonance, this kind of tidal interaction to explain them, to explain the, this majestic uh, Magellanic stream. So here, this, uh, I will show you now a simulation where we consider the tidal interaction between the pair of dwarfs, large Mag Magellanic cloud and small Magellanic cloud. So the, the model assumes that initially the large Magellanic cloud had the disk of gas and even the small Magellanic cloud had a disk of gas. And then this, this, these two disks of gas interact by resonance, by tidal interactions, and the small Magellanic cloud, it's very fancy for me. <laughs> so, and the small Magellanic cloud will lose uh, part of the disk of gas, and that's what becomes the Magellanic stream that we see around the Milky Way. So this model, you know, this is a model done with the simulation. Um, and you know, it seems to explain the origin of this Magellanic stream. So these are the two interactions, and they start forming this long, uh, this long tail. So this is an image, a radio image of the stream, of the stream of gas in the radio uh, band. And now let me show you again. Uh, let me show you. In maybe it's more visible in this, in this image here. So this is the models, the interactions between the two clouds. And you start forming the stream, roughly the size and you know, the, the shape of the stream um, roughly looks like, uh, looks like what we observe. Although you know, we are, people are trying to work on the details to really to see if we can match with the details. But that's qualitatively, you know, gives an idea, and this is quite a new, uh, quite a new result, you know, to show that the Magellanic Stream, uh, it, it has mainly to do with the interaction between two dwarfs. In a, a few years ago, it was believed for a long time this Magellanic Stream was was due only to um, uh, the interaction with the Milky Way. Indeed, it's not. It's mainly due to the interaction between the, the pair of dwarfs. So it's gravitational interaction between two dwarfs. And then, of course, it's magnified. It's uh, you know, um, magnified by the, by, the potential, by, by the potential of the big galaxy, which is the, the Milky Way. Also here, I have another movie that shows you uh, another interaction, again, between a dwarf and Andromeda. So these are the observations. So these are the observations around, this is Andromeda. And this observation shows that Andromeda has a huge halo of stars. Uh, and this is another galaxy which is called M33. It's a dwarf satellite around Andromeda. And now this is a model that tried to reproduce um, you know, these, uh, these big stars of halo, um, of stars uh, and, uh, you know, and, and the positions of the two galaxies and try to understand what's going on to form uh, you know, this image there. So here it's the little dwarf M33, which initially has a disk, which is interacted with Andromeda in the model. Now it comes uh, you know, at the maximum distance from, from Andromeda. So roughly here, it's at the apocenter, which is almost uh, 260 kiloparsec, and now it comes back. So here it's where it's now, when we have the, obs the observations uh, these days. What would have been the time scale for that encounter? Oh, I think it's, um, it's less than a giga year. 
for the first encounter. Now, you know, the dwarf came back and you, you can see that, you know, it's passing even through the, the Andromeda and it's forming, you know, a big um, uh, stream of stars. There's a, there's a bridge here of stars, which is not very clear in this image, but that we know about. So we know that there's a use, this huge bridge of stars and it starts forming, you know, all the halo um, that people usually observe. So we believe that tidal interactions, again, are responsible for some of the features that we see even in Andromeda. Also, the dwarf are interesting because I was mainly interested in this work, in, in this topic. You see these spiral arms in galaxies. One possibility that people uh, came to in the last few years is that the dwarfs may be, you know, that we cannot observe as dwarf galaxies, but these clumps of dark matter, if there are so many, maybe they cannot host all the dwarf galaxies, but some of them could punch the disk and eventually to form spiral arms as a, you know, a reaction of the disk to some perturbation by, by gravitation, because even if they are not visible, they still, you know, by gravity interact with the disk. So we are studying this now. And uh, you can, these are essentially uh, other images of other galaxies. No, like this, this might be very similar to Weber Milky Way. These are other galaxies. You can see that the spiral arms are very different from galaxy to galaxy, so they don't necessarily have the same origin. But we are now trying to understand if, you know, um, what, uh, what is the origin for some of the spiral arms. So what we did, and that's what I brought today to Tiago here, is a, a simulation where these are, this is a simulation where we, uh, con these are all the clumps of dark matter uh, which are extracted from a cosmological simulation with very high resolution. And we have introduced the disk like in our Milky Way with a little bulge. And we are looking at if uh, these, uh, if when the substructures are passing through the disk, these substructures, if, when they punch the disk, they can form spiral arms. We want to see if we can form these features. Now, we started forming features, but we are trying to understand now if they are really due to the punching of the substructures or if there are other reasons to form spiral arms. So my preliminary results show, would show that, you know, if you have a big substructures, eventually you form two round spiral arms compared to the, what might be similar to the Milky Way. So they might not be probably the same process. So it's not probably the same origin, but there are, galaxies that have also spiral arms very round. So for those kind of galaxies, not necessarily the Milky Way, that might be the reason, you know, the way to, to form spiral arms. Now, it can be also that, you know, um, a dwarf, a visible dwarf punching the disk can also create arms if it's not too big. And so it's not necessarily only the clamps. So we are trying to understand which, you know, how much, how much damage can do, uh, can, can do substructures, these satellites, you know, and which is the size which is interesting, you know, to form some features that we observe in the Milky Way. Also, I've done some previous work that I will show soon uh, as visualization from Tiago, which is much nicer than my visualization. So again, to form these spiral arms, another idea that I, uh, I followed last year was to um, in place of thinking about the substructures, um, I, I look at, you know, and in our, this galaxy, uh, in the Milky Way, there are not only stars rotating in the disk, but there are also clumps of gas which are rotating in the disk. And they co-rotate with the stars. So I've seen that this co-rotation is extremely effective to form spiral arms. I can show you here. So here, this is the disk simulated in, in my Milky Way, in my simulations. This is the disk face on. So, you know, it's perpendicular to your uh, line of sight. And this is black, so all the background are stars. And the black points are clumps of gas co-rotating with the stars. And now I show you how quickly you form arms. If you start, you know, running, uh, there's no time here, but I can tell you that in a quarter of the time of the period that the sun would rotate around our galaxy, in a quarter of the time, we form already arms. So that's a very effective way to form arms. I do believe that our Milky Way will form arms that way, not by satellites, but I have to prove it. So I haven't proved it yet. Why are spiral arms are so interesting? Because uh, it's also, it has also to do with our origin. 
So the spirals, so our sun is only two thirds of the disk in the, you know, in the location in, in the disk. And um, you know, it's known now, we know that the spirals are so effective because they are over dense regions uh, with stars and gas that by tidal interaction, they could move the sun far away from the birth location. So it's possible that our sun is an immigrant. So we are born elsewhere in the disk and we have been just drifted away from our birthplace just by the presence of the, of the spiral arms. So that's why it's so interesting also to understand the formation of spiral arms because we can understand also the origin of our sun and all our stars that, other stars that can, can have migrated as well with the sun. And finally, so I conclude, uh, so yeah, I'm almost done. So this is a simulation that Tiago did of that simulation I just showed you one minute before. So it, it's very nice, so it's much more pretty than what I did. So this is the disk of our galaxy, our Milky Way, and you can see you know, the formation of, of the arms. And inside, you can see these little clumps are these clumps of gas in the simulation. And also, you know, thanks to Chris Johnson, this was uh, exhibited at the Kimball Art Center last year. So I have uh, even an image with Kyle here and with Michelangelo is looking at our simulation. <laughs> so, so very pretty. Okay, and then my final movie is to show you the final frontier for galaxy formation. So I told you, you know, how interesting are dwarf galaxies, but I, I didn't tell you, just I want to show you that we are in the process to try to understand how, how all the Milky Way has been assembled in, in, in cosmology, so in, in our universe. And so how, um, starting from an initial field of dark matter according to the theory that we believe should be right, and then putting even gas and stars now, so how these structures do form. So this is a simulation, one of the few, that started just in you know, the first uh, two years, uh, one of the few that are uh, trying to simulate a portion of the universe, a, a big volume actually of the universe, and so forming all the galaxies at the same time, not only one. Before I showed you only dark matter, only one galaxy, our Milky Way. These are all together in a portion of the volume. And this is, unfortunately, the movies are a bit primordial in astronomy, so I hope you forgive, you forgive us for this. So this, this was done in my, in my uh, group at Harvard. So this is you know, a zoom in one portion of the universe. You see this web? The web is how the dark matter distributes in the universe. And the galaxies are essentially formed in, at the intersection of this web, of this cosmic web. You see all these white points or blue points are other galaxies along the web in the universe. So this is an example of a disk galaxy that it forms you know, um, automatically. That's interesting, look at here. This is an, these are two interacting galaxies that the ones I showed you before with the antennae, with the long tails. And indeed, uh, I just f leave you with this, um, which is I think uh, the last version of the movie. As you can see, we are surrounded by plenty of other galaxies. Here are all tidal interactions of gas. This is only gas now showed. And you can see that, but you can still see that, you know, the gas traces um, the dark matter on the, on the big uh, cosmic web. Here you see another, other long tails and streams. Okay, stop here. Thank you very much. Yes, so I really enjoyed it.